Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons and researchers. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website, website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. I'll also be posting my email address in the chat box. Please feel free to send any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're so delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert neurosurgeons, Dr. Vincent Miel. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Freelander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Freelander, thank you and please take it away. Thank you, uh, Justin. I got a pleasure to be with all of you here uh, today. And what I'd like to do, as I usually do, is provide uh, an update on the COVID situation within our hospital and our service. Uh, and then I'll introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Miel. Uh, you know, situation has uh, been fairly uh, stable. The number of uh, COVID positive uh, uh, patients within our hospital still remains uh, fairly low. Capacity is, is abundant, but what's most important, the reason I um, bring up this, uh, these comments uh, every week is uh, I really wanna make sure that everybody that needs uh, help, everybody that needs to be evaluated and treated uh, does not delay their treatment because uh, you know, worst uh, conditions and situations can occur uh, if uh, care is uh, delayed. Our hospitals are very well maintained. Uh, everybody screened at the door with a questionnaire regarding COVID uh, contacts. Their temperature is taken. If they don't have a mask, they're provided a, a free mask. Uh, we're limiting the number of uh, visitors and uh, you know a number of other uh, 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 things are being done to try to prevent any uh, problems and minimize issues uh, with, uh, with uh, COVID. So again, uh, just want to underscore the importance of not delaying care if, uh, if uh, needed. Um, beyond that, uh, uh, you know, really it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Vincent uh, uh, Mian, as of uh, uh, comments uh, before. This, uh, our Department of Neurosurgery is really the largest academic department of neurosurgery in the country. And what it allows us to do is to become very, very subspecialized. Our neurosurgeons are, um, you know, see many, many patients and many patients of, with the same issues. Um, our hospitals uh, often are the point of a last resort of patients that uh, can be helped uh, anywhere else in the region, as well as nationally and internationally. And what that results is in our, our neurosurgeons uh, being uh, uh, very, very good having a high level of expertise and being able to treat uh, these uh, kinds of uh, complex uh, patients. And uh, Dr. Uh, Miel is uh, obviously no exception to that rule. Dr. Miel really is one of our busiest uh, uh, spine surgeons. Uh, uh, many, many patients uh, uh, come in to uh, see him. And uh, as I said, very, very uh, busy, excellent uh, spine. Uh, in addition to his uh, usual clinical practice, He's also uh, been very, very involved in sports medicine. He's one of the uh, neurosurgeons that spends time uh, with, the, uh, with the Steelers. He also started a sports neurosurgery fellowship uh, for our residents, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, popular and uh, obviously a, a really great experience and learning experience uh, for the residents and a lot of fun for them, obviously, to be on, on the field uh, in, the, in, in our different uh, uh, city-wide uh, professional sports. So uh, uh, Dr. Miel is going to talk to us about uh, uh, sports medicine, in particular uh, neurosurgery. And uh, again, delighted to, to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Miel, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Freelander. A um, uh, little bit about myself. Um, I grew up around Lake Trobe, Pennsylvania uh, during the 70s and 80s. Uh, the Steelers were all, always had training camp there at St. Vincent's College. And that was sort of how I got indoctrinated, so to say, into sports. Uh, when I was a resident, my chair was Julian Bells. Uh, he was a big sports guy and was in the movie Concussion. Uh, he had a lot to do with the first cases of CTE. Uh, we did a lot with pro and college athletes and covered the Mountaineers. Uh, during my fellowship at Cleveland Clinic, I was lucky enough to uh, have Gordon Bell as one of my advisors, uh, another big sports guy in orthopedics. Uh, he came from Notre Dame to the clinic. Uh, after training, I was at West Virginia University and covered the college sports there. Um, I came to Pittsburgh because it gave me the opportunity to work with uh, the godfather of sports and neurosurgery, Joe Maroon. 
Uh, he's the most well-known neurosurgeon involved in sports in the world. Um, working with him allowed me to get better at the subspecialty and work with teams like the Steelers. Uh, today, I was going to go over how we as neurosurgeons are involved in sports and how that translates to better care for all of our patients. Um, my goal in, this, in the discussion is to go over some of the common things that we treat in athletes and importantly, how we translate that uh, and what we've learned on the field to all of our patients. The field of neurosurgery has always been intimately involved in the medical management of athletes. We're all trained to treat injuries to the brain, spinal column and spinal cord and peripheral nerves. Uh, these include both acute and catastrophic injuries like fractures, uh, spinal cord injuries, and more chronic pathologies that result from degeneration or overuse. Um, advancing the science of brain and spinal cord injuries has also been driven in a large part by neurosurgical laboratories. Uh, this includes everything from trying to develop blood markers that are used to diagnose concussion to implantable electrodes used to restore function in spinal cord injury, both of which we work on in Pittsburgh. Uh, neurosurgeons have been instrumental in the development and treat of treatment paradigms, including return to play guidelines and the acute management of severe brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. We also create uh, ever improving algorithms for the treatment of neck and back pain. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, UPMC has always been the epicenter of much of this marriage of neurosurgery and sports. Uh, from the development of modern neuropsychologic testing with Mickey Collins and Joe Maroon, to the first diagnosis of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, our institutions and our institution's physicians have, have led the way. Um, because of the Department of Neurosurgery's close connection to sports uh, in the area's teams and athletes, the opportunity to develop a fellowship in sports neurosurgery became possible. Um, this was also made possible by some great relationships and collaborations with other specialties, including orthopedics, primary care sports, and reconstructive peripheral nerve surgery. Uh, this fellowship provides a great opportunity for interested residents to spend a dedicated portion of their training with neurosurgeons that sub-specialize in sports, and it's the first program in the country. Residents also have an opportunity to rotate with other specialties, such as neuropsychology for concussion, orthopedics, and athletic trainers. Uh, these rotations allow the participant to experience how the specialties approach mutual pathologies that we all treat together as a team. So this chart shows you the main things that we take care of as far as from a neurosurgical perspective in sports, head injuries, cervical spine and problems from the spine um, in the upper extremities, lumbar spine and lower extremity pathologies, including peripheral nerves. The one thing you can see on this chart is on every one of them, there needs to be interaction with other specialists. And the one constant in all the athlete, athletes care is the, the involvement in number one, primary care, and number two, the resource that we call the training room. Uh, in sports, we're lucky enough to have a training room across the hall. We can just walk over and talk to a bunch of experts, including athletic trainers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, chiropractors, nutritional management specialists, and the conditioning coaches. Um, I, I think this is something that we absolutely need to translate to our regular patients. Uh, we need to emphasize the importance of a team approach. We're very lucky at UPMC that we do have the best in every specialty of phone call away. So it's it's not that hard to do it. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's, I think, the first tenet of care that we need to translate from sports to our regular patients. Uh, a team approach to getting them better with multidisciplinary rehab and involving other specialties when needed. One of the most common things that we see in treating athletes are head injuries and concussions. Uh, from 1990 up until the early 2000s, concussions, at least in sports, weren't thought of as much more than a nuisance injury. Uh, diagnosis was simple. Uh, if you saw, saw stars for a second, it was a ding. If they stayed around for a while longer you were, and you were wobbly, you were diagnosed with a bell ringer. Uh, if you got knocked out or had trouble getting up or speaking, you got rocked. Um, pretty primitive. Uh, treatment was about as simple as you can get. Uh, they gave you smelling salts, told you to shake it off and get back in the game. We also knew about the long-term effects of repeated head injuries that we now call chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, in fact, we knew about it for quite some time. Uh, it was first described by boxing, or described in boxing as dementia pugilistica back in 1928 um, by a pathologist named Harrison Martland. He examined the brains of boxers and could see a lot of atrophy and a lot of problems after a long career. And at that time, we looked at it as an accepted risk of participating in contact or collision sports. 
If you stayed in the game too long, you were at risk of becoming permanently damaged. A uh, commonly used term was punch drunk. Things started to change in 2005 with the Bennett Amalu article that coined the long term consequences of concussion as chronic traumatic encephalopathy after performing an autopsy on Mike Webster. For, for those of you that are not from Pittsburgh, uh, Iron Mike played center for the Steelers for a decade. Uh, he was a blue collar local and national hero. Uh, during his career, he was never diagnosed with a concussion, but it's estimated that, he, that his dosage of hits to the head was around 25,000. After retirement, he became homeless, battled psychiatric problems and substance abuse. Uh, he died at the age of 50 and was diagnosed with CTA based on autopsy findings. This is really what started the paradigm shift and the realization that concussions and subconcussive forces to the brain shouldn't be considered benign injuries. Over the last 10 years, the media saturated us all with articles and stories about the problem. Um, and the attention is warranted. Uh, there are almost two to four million concussions a year in the United States related to sports and recreation, and they can occur in up to 10% of athletes. Uh, when we look at all sports, uh, the at-risk population is about 35 million, and a lot of these are our kids. Um, how does this affect the regular person that doesn't uh, participate in organized sports? Sports, Falls, motor vehicle crashes are the number one and number two causes of people coming to the hospital with head injuries. So you definitely don't have to be an athlete to suffer a head injury or concussion. And, and what we're learning on the football field, we're translating to all these patients. One challenge to the treatment of concussions was the ever-changing definition. Um, traditionally, concussion has been conceptualized and managed from a homogenous perspective. Uh, it's amnesia, it's disorientation or confusion, balance problems. Did they get knocked out? That's a concussion. Uh, we thought of them as a one-size-fits-all injury despite completely different symptoms in different patients. Currently, I think we're pretty sure the concussion is not just a concussion. Uh, symptoms and outcomes are based on a lot of factors, including the part of the brain affected and pre-existing conditions affecting the athlete. Uh, Mickey Collins, who is sort of the godfather of neuropsych here in Pittsburgh, um, frequently states that Concussions don't play fairly. They look for your weaknesses and exploit them. So if someone has a history of depression or attention deficit disorder and a concussion, the concussion magnifies that problem. Uh, we break concussions down now into different subgroups based on symptoms, impairment, risk factors, and outcomes. Uh, vestibular subgroups have balance difficulties. Oculomotor, problems with vision, double vision, blurry vision. Uh, the cognitive and fatigue subgroup, uh, these players are foggy. They can't concentrate. Uh, they don't do well on neuropsych testing. Uh, Post-traumatic migraines or headaches are common. Um, there's an anxiety and mood sub subgroup where the players are withdrawn and depressed. Uh, a lot of players, a lot of people with concussions have continuous neck pain after concussions. That's a cervical subgroup. Um, there's often a lot of overlap between these subtypes, which can really complicate things. Proper diagnosis does allow targeted and active treatment to begin. Uh, if properly diagnosed, concussions can be treated and people get better faster. Um, no, if you, if you look at the, the treatments on this chart, you can appreciate again that we need a virtual training room and a team approach from a lot of subspecialists to properly care for all, this, uh, for all these people in this population, both the athletic population and the non-athletic population. Uh, the chart also affirms that one size does not fit all and every patient on and off the field needs an individualized treatment plan. Um, for, for those of, of you that have children uh, or uh, uh, loved ones in contact or collision sports, a great book uh, that came out about a year and a half ago by Anthony Contos and uh, Mickey Collins, Name Concussion, is definitely worth picking up. It goes over all these treatments in detail. So uh, another tenant to all of our patients that we translate from sports is one size does not fit all. Uh, this applies to the 60 year old patient with chronic low back pain just as much as it does the 22 year old uh, wide receiver. Let's look at another part of the body that we are frequently involved in treating, uh, the lumbar spine. Lumbar spine injuries are one of the most common pathologies in sports. Approximately 30% of college football players miss a game due to them. Um, injuries in this area are more common as the level of play increases. And fortunately, most are simple strains that resolve within six weeks. 
Uh, the men and women that compete place an incredible amount of force and torque on their lower back when playing and practicing. It's a pivot point that they use to translate force from their legs to their upper body. In sports, the most common causes of lumbar injuries are hyperextension, axial loads, or direct contact. Hyperextension places a lot of stress on the facet joints. Axial loads do the same to the disc, which is the main shock absorber of the spine. In the non-athletic population, low back pain is also a very common problem with a prevalence of anywhere from 60 to 80%. Um, in the general population, lumbar issues are most commonly the result of degeneration, um, problems with the joint or problems with biomechanics, uh, weak back musculature, being overweight, uh, jobs that place a lot of stress on this part of the body. The pain generators. Uh, with a lumbar injury, there are two types of pain. Uh, the first is axial mechanical back pain. This, this causes your back to hurt. Uh, same thing for your neck. Axial mechanical neck pain, it causes your neck to hurt. It's usually made worse with movement and can improve with uh, unloading the spine, lying down. <clears throat> for axial back pain, there are several pain generators. Uh, the musculature that surrounds the spine, uh, the disc complex. The, the nucleus is the rubbery part in the, in the disc that provides the shock absorption. The annulus is the ligament that holds it in place. The annulus has a lot of pain fibers, and if you damage that, your back can hurt. Damage to uh, the facet joints can also cause pain. Uh, the facet joints are posterior, and are often a, um, and they're a synovial joint that stack one on top of another, and are, are a really common problem of pain, or cause of pain. In young athletes, uh, it's common that one of these, the disc, the facet joint, the musculature, are injured causing the pain. Um, as we get older, the entire motion segment deteriorates and, and it's a lot more common that the pain is multifactorial. Um, for example, as we age, the disc can dehydrate, uh, degenerate from a lifetime of work. This causes discogenic pain. Um, the joint can collapse, the two bones get closer together. When this happens, the facet joint, that are the joints that are stacked like shingles, also get closer together and are constantly rubbing against each other, which can cause facet generated pain. Uh, when someone's back constantly hurts, they often hold themselves differently. Uh, whether they're constantly guarding or leaning forward, their biomechanics change, which puts an abnormal amount of stress and constant new stresses on the surrounding musculature. Uh, this could be an additional source of pain. The second type of pain is radicular. Uh, this is usually the result of pressure on a nerve. Uh, this is commonly caused by a disc herniation or excess tissue or bone spurs. Uh, it can be a nerve uh, coming from the lumbar spine. If that's the case, it usually causes pain from the belt line down. Uh, it can be a nerve from the neck. If that's the case, it causes pain in the shoulder or in the arm or hand. We always have to keep in mind that for radicular pain, there's a lot of mimics. Um, rotator cuff pain or shoulder pain uh, can also be caused by compression of the C5 nerve root. Uh, compression of lumbar nerve roots can cause pain in the hip area, and you have to differentiate between nerve pathology versus hip joint pathology. Two pathologies can also exist at the same time. A uh, good example is the C6 nerve root in the neck. If there's pressure on that, it can cause pain that goes down the arm to the thumb. Uh, carpal tunnel pressure, uh, median nerve uh, irritation can cause the same symptoms. Um, in these patients, we have to decide how much of the patient's symptoms are contributed to by each of the pathologies to determine which one we're going to treat first. The good about these injuries is that more than 90% resolve with conservative therapies, including limited rest, activity modification, exercise, anti-inflammatory medications, and lumbar epidural steroid injections. The downside is it can take six weeks to three months for people to get better. Um, in the elite athlete, there's a lot of pressure to return to play quickly. Um, and so it's kind of hard to tell them, you have to wait, you have to wait, you have to give it time. Same thing in the general population. There's a lot of pressure to return to work um, to take care of your family. The cervical spine has the same pain generators uh, for axial mechanical neck pain and radicular pain as the low back. Um, treatments are similar. The big difference is the spinal cord. Uh, in an adult, the spinal cord ends around T12 or L1, around where your ribs end, uh, and below that are only nerve roots. Nerve roots can cause a lot of pain. They can cause focal muscle weakness, but they're not going to paralyze you. Uh, so for the low back or lumbar spine, we're mainly treating pain. In the neck and thoracic spine, we also have to consider whether there's spinal cord compression that could lead to a permanent paralysis. 
75% of catastrophic injuries in sports involve the cervical spine. Um, fortunately, they're exceedingly rare. Um, most doctors will never see one, thank God. And, and it's, it's, it's easy to become complacent as far as what are the actions needed if such an injury occurs. And, and you can't be complacent because if it, is, it does occur, it's an emergency. Uh, so at least yearly uh, on teams, there's a, a review of procedures um, with the entire medical staff, including proper stabilization of the spine, uh, what equipment do you take off on and off the field, and who's in charge of medical transport. Uh, because these injuries are rare, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. I want to really get back to the things that we can translate from sports to all of our patients. So, so how do we create a clear path of care for these complex prob problems? Uh, first, for the neck and back, you have to define the pain. Is it mostly neck and back pain, which would be the joint? Uh, or is the biggest component radiating into the lower upper extremity, which would be pressure on a nerve root? If it's both, which one is worse? That's the one we're going to go after first. Um, after that, you define the pain generators. Is it the disc? Is it the facet joint? Is it the musculature? You have to remember that there's often more than one. Finally, and most importantly, you have to clarify the goals of treatment. Um, is it to play in the Super Bowl next week or is it to get ready for the next season? If it's the former, treatment's going to be focused on injections and therapy. The latter could include a discussion of surgery. The same clarity is needed for a 60-year-old that we see in clinic for back or leg pain. Are they very active with the goal of running a marathon, or is their main goal to be able to play with their grandchildren with less pain? Uh, treatments are different for both of those. Uh, we also have to manage expectations. Um, we can improve the lives of most people, uh, but, but making a patient with 20 years of back pain and severe degenerative disc disease pain-free is hard to accomplish. So our third tenet is to develop a solid game plan defining both the pathology and the treatment goals with the pa patient uh, as part of the team. A word on injections. We rely on the inter nerve inter interventionalist a lot. Uh, they help us diagnose the source of pain. Uh, for example, in a patient with axial neck pain or back pain, it's sometimes hard to tell how much is coming from the degenerated disc versus how much is coming from the facet joint. Uh, if they numb the facet joint, most of the pain improves temporarily, then it's safe to assume the joint's causing the majority of the pain. You can go, that's your target. Uh, similarly, they can selectively inject numbing medicine around a nerve root to determine if that's the source of radicular pain. The interventionalist can also provide longer term treatment of the pain by adding a steroid to the injection to decrease inflammation. Uh, they can also ablate pain transmitter, transmitting nerves in a diseased joint. Uh, this procedure is called a radio frequency ablation and works very well in patients with axial neck or axial back pain. Non-surgical care usually involves a five-point plan that can all be quantitated. Uh, augmentation of physical well-being, uh, weight loss, are they at the proper weight, smoking cessation, uh, aerobic exercise, increasing blood flow decreases the chemicals uh, that uh, increase inflammation. Stretching exercises and strengthening exercises, isometric core strengthening, restorative yoga are all great things in a care plan. Pain regimens, including non steroidal anti inflammatories, epidural steroid injections, and some kind, sometimes short term pain medication. So, so when do we resort to surgery? Uh, certainly in patients with worsening neurologic deficits or impending deficits, like those with spinal cord compression. Uh, we also consider surgery in athletes that can't compete due to intractable pain that, is, that have felt conservative therapy. Likewise, in our non-athlete population, we consider surgery when their pain significantly affects their lives and they have failed conservative therapies. Our goals of surgery in an athlete are, number one, a quick recovery. We want them to get back into, the compet into competition as soon as possible. We want to minimize the disruption of their normal biomechanics. Uh, fusions are last resort. Uh, we preserve as much normal anatomy as possible. Uh, we minimize dissection uh, to minimize strength loss. If you take a step back and think about this, uh, isn't this what every single one of your patients wants? Uh, the use of the least invasive and minimally disruptive technique that we can and still that we can use and still expect a good outcome. Uh, neurosurgeons have spent most of their careers perfecting microsurgical techniques that certainly can be applied to spine surgery. Uh, using a microscope for surgery provides a better view of the anatomy so that we can use smaller incisions with smaller retractors. 
Minimizing electric cautery helps reduce damage to the surrounding nerves and muscles. Um, if possible, we split muscles versus cutting them or separating them from their blood supply to, um, to reduce the problems with strength loss with surgery. As I said before, fusions are last resort, but when required, we're using more, com we're more commonly performing them using minimally invasive techniques. Uh, the lateral approach with specialized retractors is a, good, is a good example of this. We can accomplish a fusion with a very small incision with minimal blood loss and muscle disruption. Anterior cervical discectomies and fusions are one of the most common procedures we do. Uh, this surgery is usually performed for disc herniations and involves removal of the entire disc and fusing the joint. In many patients, we can decrease the disruption of normal biomechanics by implanting a disc replacement uh, to avoid a fusion, it's sort of like getting a, a knee or hip replacement. Uh, when indicated, uh, patients that undergo disc replacements have less change in their biomechanics and can get back to a normal life sooner. Cervical foraminotomies are another great way that we can treat a disc herniation without fusing the individual uh, with a very small incision. Uh, surgery is done posteriorly. We move the nerve with the aid of an operating microscope and are able to remove the disc herniation with minimal disruption of the patient's normal anatomy. So, minimally disruptive surgeries are another part of the care of the athlete that we translate to all of our patients. We want to use as, as many minimally invasive techniques as we can. We want to think about preserving biomechanics as much as we can, including techniques that preserve motion. Probably one of the biggest advantages we have when treating athletes is access to the talent in the training room. I mentioned this before. Um, access to certified athletic trainers, uh, PTOT, chiropractic care, conditioning coaches, nutrition experts, it's invaluable. Um, it, it's also, it's, it seems like it'd be very hard to duplicate in our general population. So, so how can we duplicate it? We're really lucky at the University of Pittsburgh that we have access to the UPMC Centers for Rehab Services. Um, this is about as close as you can get to a personal training room because there's over 70 locations. They're everywhere. Uh, and the availability of the same specialists that we use in the sports community is available there. Um, so we do have a virtual training room that seems to work very well and is, a, is a, the next best thing to having a training room in every one of our offices. I think the last piece of the puzzle is, is wellness. Um, why do athletes get better faster? Um, they're often younger than the non-athlete patient. There's not a lot we can do about that. Um, motivation is a factor in, in how well you heal and how quickly you get back to, uh, to your life. Uh, but that can be found in the husband or wife that needs to get back to work for their family just as much as it can be found in an athlete uh, desperate to return to play. So I think that's a wash. Um, Nutrition and conditioning are almost universally better in the athletic population than the general public, and they definitely affect outcomes. So these are two things that we can really key on to try to improve in our general population to get them to heal as quickly and do as well as our athletic population. So, so why is nutritional status so important in, any, in a surgical patient? Uh, quite simply, you need calories to heal. Uh, when we perform surgeries, we do damage tissue. It needs to regenerate, which creates a hypermetabolic state. Uh, the protein and energy needs of the patient go up. Uh, nutrients from fat and skeletal muscle are redistributed to more metabolically active tissue like the liver and visceral organs. Uh, this redistribution can easily result in protein calorie malnutrition within days. And, and obviously the rate of development depends on the preoperative nutritional status of the patient. Poor nutrition is an independent determinant of increased morbidity and mortality after adjusting for non-nutritional factors. Uh, patients with poor nutritional status also have higher lengths of stay in the hospital, higher readmission rates. They're also more likely to be discharged to a facility versus going home. As the patient gets older, the nutrition almost always gets worse. Uh, the average elderly man consumes only 70% of the recommended daily allowance of kilocalories. The elderly woman's even lower at 63%. Uh, so, so chronic undernutrition occurs commonly in our older patient population. The problem is not just with calories in general, it's, it's nutrient intake, um, calcium, vitamin B12, vitamin D, and folate. You need all those to heal, and all these are commonly below the recommended daily allowance in our older population.
we recognize that optimizing nutrition is vital, uh, and we now routinely perform nutritional assessments in all of our preoperative patients. Um, this includes any, it starts with a history and physical exam. We can do anthropometrics where we measure muscle mass and, and skin folds. Labs for nutrition are routinely done on every patient and if abnormal are corrected before surgery. There are a lot of nutritional assessment tools out there too that take five or 10 minutes to perform and can be done preoperatively to help prehabilitate the patient before surgery. What about conditioning? Um, something that's partially a result of poor conditioning and age that can play a huge negative role in surgical outcomes is sarcopenia. Uh, sarcopenia is a progressive age-related loss of muscle mass, leading to loss of strength, power, mobility, and function. A picture's worth a, a thousand words. These are two 72-year-old women, cross sections of their thighs. The one on the left is normal, the one on the right has sarcopenia. And you can see that the muscle mass is about half the size. We have, we have two types of muscle fibers, type one and type two. Type one are the slow twitch. They're better at endurance activities. Uh, type one are fast twitch. They're better producing power. In sarcopenia, we lose a lot more of the type two fibers. So we lose a lot more power. Um, the end result with less power, make, it makes it harder for, us, for the patient to get up from a chair, makes, them, makes it harder for the patient to climb stairs. It makes it harder for the patient to steady themselves to keep from falling and participate in physical therapy. Uh, there are a lot of ways to screen for sarcopenia, um, including questionnaires such as, such as a SARC-F. Uh, good physical exam uh, is definitely number one. Um, two of the most reliable tests of sarcopenia um, are the hand grip dynamometer and gait speed analysis, both of which can easily be done in a clinic in less than a minute. Uh, there are three treatment arms for sarcopenia. Uh, dietary, so nutrition has to be appropriate. Uh, medication, supplements, and hormones uh, still being worked on, and it's, the science is still being worked out. We know that if we give someone that's older testosterone, we can make their muscles bigger, but we're getting mixed results as, as far as actually making them stronger and more powerful. Uh, physical activity is the key. Exercise is the cornerstone of sarcopenia treatment. Uh, strength and resistance training, progressively overloading the major muscle groups, increases muscle fiber size, number, and function. Uh, aerobic exercise, while it's really important for heart health and lung health, it has little benefit with sarcopenic patients. So uh, to summarize, uh, how do we translate our care of athletes to all patients? First, we use a team approach with the patient's primary care docs involved, other medical specialists, and an expert rehab team. All patients are individuals with unique problems and goals. Uh, the treatment plans need to identify these problems and define the goal with the patient as part of the team. Uh, when we need to perform surgery, our goal is to do the smallest surgery possible that will achieve the patient's goals. Uh, the surgeries utilize minimally invasive techniques that minimize disruption of the patient's normal biomechanics. Um, and finally, nutrition and conditioning are vital to a good outcome. Uh, ideally, we start with a prehabilitation plan after surgery rehabilitation, and it doesn't end there, then you have to develop a long-term long -term wellness plan with the patient so they don't have problems in the future. Um, using these principles, we've been very successful at providing the same level of care to all of our patients that we provide with the elite athletes. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Mio. What an incredible presentation. Uh, we're going to begin our Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to make a comment before we begin? Uh, sure. Thank you, uh, uh, Vince. Really wonderful presentation and uh, a great example of how somebody who becomes uh, excellent on the clinical side can really expand to make a difference uh, for athletes, it's a it's a it's a different uh, level of uh, responsibility in terms of what needs to be done. One thing is to take care of our general population, which obviously we take uh, incredibly seriously. But of somebody who then is uh, you uh, do or do not do surgery on the spine, as an example, and then they have to go and play football or different uh, different uh, sports. Uh, the level of risk and uh, and capabilities are are, are different. I uh, want to underscore the importance of one of the uh, issues that were commented, uh, which were 
the uh, the notion of prehabilitation and post rehabilitation. So before uh, surgery, obviously, if somebody needs surgery or or afterwards. And one point that you know, I'm, I'm incredibly um, passionate about is about uh, really discussing at great uh, depth and length uh, um, the the toxic nature of smoking. Smoking uh, really is is a a poison to so many different processes in in our body from uh, A through Z. Uh, one of the things I do are, uh, is aneurysm, brain aneurysm surgeries, for example. And, you know, smoking is the one factor that we know that makes aneurysms grow in a rupture. But for any kind of surgery, uh, the, uh, the fact that somebody smokes really puts people at so much higher risk of uh, complications from infections, from wound healings and, and uh, pneumonia and uh, so on and so forth. So everybody knows that uh, smoking is a uh, is bad, but in particular for anybody undergoing a surgery, it, it really uh, um, uh, increases the likelihood of there being a, a problem. So Dr. Miel, thank you for uh, putting all this uh, thought together on a, on a really uh, uh, great uh, summary and, and putting together your experience. So uh, Justin, if you want to go through uh, uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Uh, Dr. Miel, just uh, I'm going to start off with a comment for you. Uh, Dr. Miel, you were my surgeon a few years back. You took excellent care of me and made me feel at ease during a really scary time. Thank you for your presentation. So just a nice comment to start us off there. That's nice. Thanks. Um, what advice do you have for a medical student who is considered neurosur considering neurosurgery? <laughs> um, wow. I mean, it's, it's a great field. I mean, if you're, if you're considering it, I, I say number one is spend time with neurosurgeons. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a very competitive field, so you have to do well in school. Um, the, the more time, do you really want to do it? Spend time with different neurosurgeons and not just if you can, a, a day's good, but if you can spend a week or if you can do a little rotations, a, uh, a couple weeks, uh, you're going to learn a lot more. You're going to see the, the good and the bad. It's not just going to be a, like a, an interview where you see all the good stuff. Um, publications are really helpful. So make sure when you're in medical school that you're writing, you're doing research. Um, and sort of when, when you do rotate, research the guy that you're going to rotate with or the woman you're going to rotate with. They, they'd like to know that you're interested and, uh, and, and care about what they do. Um, if, if neurosurgery interests you, I think it is one of the best professions you could ever, ever do. It's hard. Uh, it, it's a lot of work with it, but it's very, very fulfilling. You, you really have the ability to change pe people's lives for the better. So it's a good luck. Thank you. Uh, I see some helmets behind you there, Dr. Miao. Uh, question for you. What professional and collegial teams do you work with? I, uh, I work with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, we also work with other teams in the NFL. So it's not really so. A lot of the, the people that we see are from different colleges, high schools, colleges and professional teams uh, across the country. Uh, they come, a lot of it's because of word of mouth. Uh, you treat somebody, you do a good job, and then other athletes want to come to you. So right now, the officially, I'm the independent neurologic consultant for the Pittsburgh Steelers in the NFL. Uh, but we work with, I, we did operate on two professional basketball, basketball players in the last month from out of state. So we, we do all over the country. People come. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of nutritional questions here. You had some great slides about nutrition. Um, if a patient is in, is in rehab in the hospital setting, uh, why is the nutrition not focused on healing? Increased protein, decreased unnecessary sugars. Um, food from general hospital kitchen seems to lack the needed nutritional focus. Should physicians prescribe these enhanced dietary needs for patients? They absolutely should. And if, if they're not, that's a problem if it's not. So, I mean, the, the dietary department at most hospitals and, and definitely at uh, the, the UPMC hospitals do concentrate on on adequate nutrition with their meals. Uh, we, again, routinely do nutrition laboratories. If anything's down, if the albumin or the protein or the pre-albumin's down, we also prescribe supplemental um, protein, uh, milkshakes, Ensure, um, that, that, that help the patient get better faster. The goal has to be optimize nutrition so they heal faster, they'll do better in rehab, they'll have less chance of infection, they'll get home sooner. Another nutrition question here. Uh, what do you feel the benefits of fish oil is for, for 
patients? I think it's beneficial. I, I mean, a couple of things. Number one is that heart health. I think it definitely decreases inflammation. I think it's good for heart health. Uh, it also has anti-inflammatory properties. So uh, joint pain. I, I take fish oil uh, and when, I'm, when my back starts aching. And I definitely think it plays a role. Okay, uh, thank you. Traumatic uh, spinal injury is something that non-athletes never expect to happen to them. What should people know, consider, if they ever find themselves or a loved one in unexpected traumatic accidents? That's that's hard. Um, I mean, you never expect to have a, a catastrophe happen to you. Um, car accidents, spinal cord injuries, head injuries um, do happen. It's a part of life. Um, I, I think the good thing about our team is that we do a, a great job of helping these pay people, giving them the best chance. Um, the, you have to take care of yourself. If it's a family member, you have to be strong for them. So you can't get sick. So you have to sleep. You have to be able to eat. You have to be able to go home and take care of anything else. And, and our job is to let you do that and, and feel comfortable doing that, knowing that we're taking care of them. Um, there's a lot, a lot of advances coming with spinal cord injury. There's a lot of advances coming with brain injury where I think people are going to, we're going to see improvements in people that uh, before we, we wouldn't have much hope with as far as regaining function. I think, I think uh, we're going to start seeing more and more technologies where function is restored. Thank you. Um, are you happy with the programs instituted by NFL to prevent concussions? Yes. Um, the, the program, uh, the, the protocol, I, I think it started in, uh, let's see, 2009. Uh, it's been adjusted and tweaked for, for about a decade. Uh, the, uh, in 2017, a lot of changes were made because of some, some people going back to play that were diagnosed with concussion for, for competitive reasons. I think the Seahawks got fined $100,000 for that. Currently, it, it seems cumbersome that it all makes sense. We have the, everybody involved in detecting concussions. We have the medical team, um, the doctors as part of the team. We have the uh, all the athletic trainers. We have uh, unaffiliated uh, neurologic experts on the field. Uh, we have ATC spotters up with, with uh, reviewing film and using binoculars to look for, for injuries on the field. Um, and we, we also put it on the players. If, if something happens to your teammate, if they have signs of concussion, you have to report it to us. Uh, when it gets reported, it's, it's becoming, again, it, it seemed cumbersome, a lot of bodies, but it, it's, it's become pretty slick. The patient comes off the field. If there's any question, they go to the locker room. Uh, the UNC and the uh, medical team do an evaluation. Uh, they do a, uh, they review the video. If there are any signs of concussion, if there's any question about it, they're out. That's the safe thing. That's the good thing to do. If there are no signs of concussion, they can go back in. Um, I, I am happy with it. I think it is it, it's it's making the game a lot safer. It's protecting people that otherwise would just play through it. Um, so yeah, bottom line is I'm very happy with it. Thank you. How do you think injectables will advance change in the future? And injectables as far as, is there more to the question? Or just injectables? That's the question. Yeah, that's okay. the question. So I mean, injectables as far as uh, neurointervention, the, uh, I mean, the big things, I mean, the, the two major categories with them are injecting local anesthetics or injecting steroids to decrease inflammation. Those are used for diagnosis and for treatment. Um, the, uh, some of the other things they do, like ablations, you could, it's, it's not really an injection, but they use a needle to do it to, to help uh, uh, with um, uh, getting rid of some of the pain fibers in an injured uh, or pathologic joint. Uh, if we're talking about injections for like stem cells or uh, PRP, um, right now, uh, PRP is really, really good at helping big tendons and ligaments. It creates inflammation in the ligament or tendon and helps it. So knee, it really, really helps. Uh, in the spine, there's, I mean, there's promise, but not a lot of good evidence yet that it's going to help. Uh, but some people are injecting PRP into the facet joints. Uh, likewise, stem cells into the disc space. Uh, it has potential, uh, but the science hasn't been proven yet. So so for now, I'm holding off on that, but I, I do think there's a lot of promise there. Okay, maybe sort of along the same lines. How do neurosurgeons apply personalized medicine and genomics to spinal surgeries? Hmm, personalized, again, it's 
every patient's an individual. Everybody acts differently as far as how, how they do with medicines, how they do with anesthesia, how well do they fuse. So a lot of that is just getting to know the patient, getting to know their family history, uh, understanding what their problems are and what their goals are. Uh, once you do that, then you can better define individual care for that patient. Someone that has a, a long family history of osteoporosis or uh, someone that um, um, is not going to be very active, you're going to treat differently than, than someone that's going to be very, very active and has a, a family history uh, of living to 110 years old. So just case by case patient, patient, you look at each patient, you look at the family history, you look at the patient's history. Thank you. Uh, what advice do you give to youth sports programs to help avoid head and spine injuries? Uh, I mean, good, good education. Good education starts with the coaches and the training staff, and, and it works its way down. A uh, good coach teaches kids how to how to tackle. It teaches kids not to use their head, not to spear tackle. Um, and, and again, uh, the, the big thing, it, it's a trickle down. The NFL is getting really good at this, and they're really helping the the, the high schools and the below high school level uh, coaches perform the proper techniques um, and, and do a good job protecting their athletes. I think I think collision sports right now are safer than they've ever been because of this. So training, bottom line is training, good training, good coaching, teaching the kids how to be safe. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what makes neurosurgery at UPMC and Pitt different from other places? Wow. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's one of the biggest residency programs in the country. Uh, the, the history at University of Pittsburgh is, is just is just amazing. Uh, when you go back, when you look at the wall, when you go into the Department of Neurosurgery, there's a wall and there's every resident that graduated from this program. And it, it's amazing where they've gone and what they've done. And, and when you go, it's almost, again, go to the Pittsburgh Steelers. When you go to any any state in the country any city there's always a pittsburgh steelers bro there's always someone that's moved from pittsburgh somewhere else and still a fan uh, with 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 our neurosurgery department it, it's it has so many people that are, are legends in the field that have gone other places so you can go to any city or any state and and you're going to find the top of the field coming from university of pittsburgh so it's just, it's 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 very i'm um, very fortunate to be a part of that Thank you. We have uh, we have one more question and then we'll wrap it up here for the day. Dr. Mio, what do you love most about the work that you do? I, I like uh, helping people. Um, I just, I mean, the ability to change someone's life for the better. Um, the, the job's stressful. Um, the um, the hours are long. Um, but I mean, just, just if you can change one person's life for the better, God, it's worth it. Um, so yeah, I just, I like helping people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Miao. We really appreciate you taking time out today. What an incredible presentation. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to wrap us up for the day? Uh, sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Miao, for a you know, really inspiring uh, presentation uh, on everything that you've done. You know, one of the things that uh, people talk about and, and, and ask is, uh, you know, is it worth for a child as well as a young adult and an adult uh, to uh, expose themselves to kind of injuries which uh, you know have many many negative uh, uh, potential implications and I have uh, two thoughts one is always the the, the, ball, the balance of uh, the, the pluses and the minuses they're you know being part of a sports uh, uh, team uh, you know provides a lot of a uh, you know physical health, uh, mental health, and so many other positive uh, uh, things. So that's that's a very, very important component. And the other one is, uh, as Vince uh, mentioned, the, you know, the precautions that are being taken from the equipment, from the knowledge of uh, concussions and concussion uh, prevention uh, programs. And if, God forbid, anybody has a concussion or a spinal cord injury, clearly the, the therapies are, are better and better. So it's always a a, a, a balance, but we're definitely in a place that's uh, as best as it's uh, ever been between you know, equipment and knowledge and, and all of that. So that's uh, really been nice uh, to see uh, uh, Dr. Miel put it all uh, uh, together and really provide all the uh, his expertise uh, to what uh, uh, what we do. So uh, again, uh, thank you for for your presentation uh, was uh, uh, terrific. Uh, thank you for everybody that's uh, attended uh, uh, today. 
uh, and uh, we all uh, look forward to seeing you in the near future. Uh, stay safe and uh, uh, be well and uh, eat all your broccoli. Take care.